over a span of 2,000 years, 40 authors on three different continents and in three different languages penned 66 books, all of which were supernaturally inspired and intricately designed as God's revelation to man. The spoken word of God, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, recorded and bound just for us. Join us on a journey from Genesis to Revelation, all 66 books, the big book, cover to cover. This is Michael Easley in Context. You know, depending on your age, your education, uh, where you are in life, your background experiences, uh, we, it's not uncommon to hear older generations say, you know, things are going to pot. It's just not the way it used to be. Can you believe what's going on with our education system? What happened to reading, writing, and arithmetic? Why are we in all these liberal arts studies? What's gone on with our country? And it can become very interesting and also reveal a lot about our worldview. Uh, you know the term revisionists. So revisionists come along and they rewrite history. I don't know. How many of you loved history as a student? Real high so I can get a, a percentage. Yeah, That's a, You're a pretty high, high uh, percentage audience. How many of you hated history? Be, brow, be, be brave. Come on. You hated history. And you probably hated history because you had a bad history teacher. More, more, more than likely. If you had a great history teacher, it's nothing more than current events. We're talking about current events at a different time. And great history teachers are, I mean, they're phenomenal storytellers who can remind and retell. Well, revisions will come along and they will change things because of all sorts of issues, whether it's something as simple as political correctness or sometimes we do find out new things and we rewrite history, so to speak. Um, Right now in our political landscape, which is littered with all kinds of interesting ideologies and pockets, uh, there's a move to uh, uh, change the whole form of government, the three branches of government that built this country. And uh, if we become socialist or we do it with electoral college or if we uh, go to simple majorities for all votes or if we uh, build a bigger Supreme Court, all these things are roiling around. It gets a lot of Americans, a lot of people upset, and of course they take it out on social media. And we express our opinions about these things. When someone talks about, uh, for example, socialism being an ideal form of government, that tells me two things. One, they know nothing about socialism. And two, they got a very bad education. Because if you study anything about socialism historically, there's no socialist government that succeeds. And that's why America, from just a common sense point of view, a free market economy with three branches of government has been so favored, I hesitate to use the word God blessed, but has been so favored because it makes good common sense. The balances of the three arms of the government were designed, imperfect though they be, the best experiment on the historical planet, other than a benevolent dictator, which are hard to find. So we live in this context, and when someone pushes socialism, we'll get all ginned up about it. And all, you know, and I've had friends recently say, I've quit watching the news. I can't watch the news. How many of you feel like that? I've gotten to that point. I'll read some stuff, but I just can't, I can't handle it anymore. It's gotten so out of hand. Now, we could talk about this a long time. You might disagree with me completely. You might want to be a socialist. God bless you. You know, go, go for it. Um, my point in that little rabbit trail is to say, If you are uneducated about a subject or have forgotten the history, you don't understand the importance and the application going forward. How much more when it comes to biblical theology? If you as a person who calls yourself a Christian, if you do not understand why you believe what you believe, you're in greater danger than America being sold a new form of government. If you don't know why you believe what you believe and the biblical theology and the foundation stones that were set in place, you're on shifting sand with your relationship with God, with your uh, 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 worldview, with your outlook on things, and you can be uh, in a lot of trouble very quickly. Um, There are churches in the area that, uh, not to be unkind, but they have some pretty wonky false teaching going on. If you don't have a 
baseline education for what Scripture is about, application of that, understanding of that, integrating of that, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, it's a dangerous piece of of territory. When we go through First and Second Chronicles, um, we had this discussion early on. If you're newer to Stonebridge, I've done something I've never done before. I'm teaching a book of the Bible each week. So it's been an educational and exasperating challenge for me personally, but I'm learning things I have never seen in all the years of studying the Bible. And so I, it's been a delight in that regard. And when I came to First and Second Chronicles, I debated to do, uh, like each of these First and Second books, should I do, you know, do them together. So I'm serv- there's no way. And I want to show you some of the highlights and why I want to spend, give you a big picture of First Chronicles. Um, let's go back to the teaching methodology that God gave Israel. And it comes out of Deuteronomy 6, the great Shema. And the great Shema is built on a word. Uh, Shema means to listen or pay attention or behold or listen up, we might say in the south. Pay attention. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, to, to your sons, and talk. you shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That's called a Hebraism. It's in the ups and downs, the ins and outs of life. In, in other words, in all of your goings and comings, your risings and sitting, in your work, in all of life, Teach your children these principles, these things. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. What were those called? Phylacteries. And the Jews took this literally, which had a literal application, but the idea was keep the Word of God near your your mind and keep the Word of God in your hand when you work. Do this to the glory of the Lord. Think biblically when you go to work as a doctor, as a teacher, as an educator, as a, a, a computer technology expert. You know, keep God in mind as you work with your hands, as you use your brain, in and out, coming and going of life. Uh, remember, I told you stories about I used to drive carpool once a week uh, to give Cindy a break when I was back in Virginia. And so Mondays I would drive car, the carpool. And rather than, you know, they're tired. They don't want to go to school. They're, they're bored. They've had a long weekend. They hate going back to school Monday. And so I'd ask questions. And, and sometimes they would pay attention. Sometimes they just ignored me. But I had fun. And uh, we'd see a wreck. And they'd go, how does that wreck remind you of sin? <laughs> and it's fascinating to see what a van load of kids will say. You know, or you're in traffic. And goes, what does traffic teach us about life? patience or whatever. People are stupid. Okay, whatever. And, and, then, and you run on those rabbit trails and you bring them to a passage. You bring them to a verse. What does God want us to do when we're in long lines? So that's teaching, come and going in and out. That's what this passage is underscoring. But what they did is took it literally and they put these leather boxes on their head and they wrapped them around their wrists, their arms, only the men by the way, and the letter on the front of that box is the Hebrew letter. It looks like a W in English, but it's the, it's the, it's the letter SH for Shema. It's the abbreviation. And in those phylacteries are, is this passage handwritten by a male rabbi, only a man, and folded in that phylactery or in the little mezuzah on the door. You'll see them in Jewish homes. This is the passage inside that. Why? You shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, there was a literal application to this, but it became sort of Walmart versus Neiman Marcus. How are you going to have a phylactery? What's the mezuzah going to look like? And it's still true today. The point was, then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you Great and splendid cities, which you did not build. And houses full of good things, which you did not fill. And hewn cisterns, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. And you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God 
and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you. For the Lord your God is in the midst of you, is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. Strong medicine. If then, if you follow me, I will bless you. If you obey me, I will bless you. If you do as I say, I will help you defeat the enemies who will come to kill you. And this was to be wrapped around their head, wrapped around their working arm, taught to their children repeatedly all of their lives because we forget. And as Dana said, repetition, repetition, repetition. And many of the times when we're reminded, oh, yeah, I remember that, but what? I forgot. We talked about this last week. The first most frequent command in Scripture is, do not be afraid. And somewhere in the second or third are, don't forget or remember, some iteration of God telling us this. So when Israel obeyed, God blessed them, and obviously he withheld blessing, and sometimes he brought discipline in the form of of, uh, exile, in the form of other uh, nationalities defeating them, and all sorts of trauma that occurred in their history. The title Chronicles is a bit of a misnomer. This this word didn't even show up in the Bible until the 4th century. And Jerome, who is attributed to being the most brilliant uh, Catholic scholar, was the one who did most of the translation work in the Bibles you now have. But then, of course, through iterations of English language and so forth, have been revised and more literal and so forth and so on. But Jerome was the one who came up with the word chronicles. Uh, Prior to that, the old Hebrew titles for this book were The Things Left Behind, which sounds like loose change. And that's not a bad way of thinking about it. When we've gone through 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Samuel, what did we miss? And what needs to be reminded that reading through those stories might not have been organized. So what the chronicler does, and we don't know who wrote it by the way, technically, what the chronicler does is he organizes this in a magnificent way, but at first blush it seems like a bunch of lists and genealogies and tedious repetitions. Listen to what uh, Ken Boa and Bruce Wilkinson say about this in that book I've mentioned many times, Talk Through the Bible. The, book, uh, the books of First and Second Chronicles cover the same period of time in 2 Samuel through 2 Kings. But the perspective is different. These books are no mere repetition of the same material. Rather, they are a divine editorial of the history of God's people. I love that. A divine editorial of the history of God's people. While 2 Samuel and Kings give political uh, history of Israel and Judah, Chronicles gives a religious history of the Davidic dynasty in Judah. Remember Israel in the north, Judah in the south, the divided kingdom. They continue, the former were written from a prophetic and moral viewpoint, the latter from a priestly spiritual perspective. The book of 1 Chronicles begins with the royal line of David and traces the spiritual significance of David's righteous reign. As a reminder, I want to encourage you, Tom Constable's notes, if you can just remember the name Constable, just like a sheriff or a constable, they're free online, Plano Bible Church, I think, in Plano, Texas. If you put Constable and Bible Study in your search engine, it will go to the first hit will be the Plano Bible Church. Every book of the Bible, he's got a section of notes. I cannot, I cannot encourage you enough to bookmark this and go there. If you're a BSF or a precept, when, when you can't, you can't cheat. But when you can use resources, uh, this is a great place to go to because he, he does an aggregate of dozens of dozens of commentaries and puts them in one place. So his links are great, and much of which my framework today, some of it was taken from Dr. Constable's notes. So just a reminder that that's available to you. Um, Chronicles contains the official records of the kings in great detail, specifically with David. And I remind you, because this was news to me, you never hear about the kingdom starting with Saul. It's not only the Messianic covenant, but it, Saul was the failure. He was the first epic failure of the monarchy. So the history doesn't begin. It's recorded, but the references don't go back to it at the beginning of Saul's reign. It always goes back to the Davidic reign. 
Now, again, they can seem repetitious and tedious and so forth, but let's not hurry through. You know, when I'm tempted to hurry through a passage of the Bible, I have this uh, voice in my head that says, Michael, it's still a page of the Word of God. It's still a page. I don't like reading genealogies any more than you do. And I really hate having to read them out loud and try to pronounce all those hard names. But God in eternity past believed it was important for us to have that record. So when you come to those genealogies, maybe you don't spend a month studying them, which, by the way, would actually yield a lot of surprise if you did. But nevertheless, just because we might not be interested in them, don't dismiss them because they're boring or tedious. It is a page of the Word of God. When it comes to the Bible, there is no meaningless repetition. One commentator named Sarah Jappet points out four points I think are interesting. The chronicler writes his history as a series of literary blocks, she calls them. Each is a comprehensive unit revolving around a specific topic marked with formal features. What she's saying is the structural design of chronicles is really a a literary form. And it's telling us something about why the chronicler put it together this way. Secondly, she comments about speeches. The chronicler has speeches that aren't always uh, recorded in the other Kings and Samuel records, along with public ceremonies and lists. So step back, what she's just observed is this author was organized. If you're a disc person, this author was a high C. This author liked details, and that's part of the explanation. She continues, the genre was a general category of historiography, divine speeches, royal addresses, prophetic exhortations, oracles, prayers, letters, dialogues, and much more. I'm going to give you three kind of broad term strokes, and I'm going to talk about what I would consider my observations for the book. It's how you put your arm around it. But first, let's talk about genealogies. These are tedious, but they're detailed records of Israel's history. And um, I I find it so interesting today, the uh, American appetite for the uh, DNA tests. I don't know if you've done yours or not. I don't want to do mine because I'll probably find out something unsavory. Uh, but uh, no, I, I just I don't want to do it. I don't know why. Maybe I will one day. But I, I find it, some people are obsessed with doing these things. There was a, uh, MIT did a study and they took uh, a number of people and they all did them through the three primary groups that are selling them and their results were very different. So right there, go, okay, now what do we do? Uh, well, if you have a good record, it's reliable. And that's what you have in the genealogy. Secondly, worship. The detail of worship talked about in this book of more like an accounting dream about the ark, about the temple complex itself, about the regulations, about how worship was to be done when the exiles, as Dana mentioned, returned back home. How do you restart worship when it's been put on hold for such a long period of time? Who remembers what to do? Nobody. So the chronicler recorded it so that when they returned from exile, there'd be a plan of attack. of Now, what do we do next? What do we do first? What do we, what's the most important thing we do? Um, you remember the story of uh, in 1 Chronicles 13 when David sends to retrieve the ark. And they put it on a new cart, remember? And Uzzah, the poor unfortunate guy, the, it wobbles and he reaches out to stabilize it and God strikes him dead. Remember that great story? Uh, they had forgotten how to handle the ark. If you don't remember, if it's not taught repetitively, you will forget how God intended these things to be done. And there was a very specific way. The priests alone were to move that box, and they were doing it all the wrong way. And God said, look, you can't treat me in a cavalier fashion. I'm holy. And this object was the physical representation of where God put his name, where God dwelt, and you don't put me on an ark and let me go down a hill, on a cart. You carry me with poles, and only a certain priesthood segment could do that. And they had to relearn all these things. Um, sacrifices are explained in great detail. The, 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 the way they have to reset the temple complex, <clears throat> excuse me, once it's finally up and operational, it's a 24-7 operation. There were morning and evening sacrifices, but there were 24-7 operations of water and fire and animal husbandry, 
all that went along with the temple complex, it was a not, if you've been around a dairy farmer, think of a dairy farm that's a worship complex. You don't get to take a break. You don't get a day off. In fact, the holidays are more involved than the regular days. So the worship center complex was a busy, active uh, building and tent complex that required thousands of servants to maintain it. We have a very poor picture of this, and it's all detailed in the book of Chronicles. We also read of the most critical real estate transaction in history. And that is the securing of what was known as Ornan's threshing floor. And that story is where David, God tells Nathan to tell David, you go acquire the threshing floor that Ornan Ornan owns right now. His threshing floor happened to be the top of Mount Moriah. That's the same place as Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him. It's the same rock. Today it's called the Dome of the Rock. If you used to see the Herodian Plaza and to see a, a modern picture of Israel today, you see the, the, the Islamic Dome of the Rock with the gold roof. <clears throat> Probably a little bit south of that would be the pinnacle of Mount Moriah. A threshing floor was an area where you could beat out, in this case, grain, not wines, where you could beat out grain and the natural wind that went across would blow the, cha- the chaff off of the grain. And so when we made this fun about Gideon beating out wheat in a wine press, how bad things were, you know, you kind of make do with what you have. Well, the threshing floor on the top of Mount Moriah was the place where Isaac was offered, where God told him to go sacrifice your son. Somebody else is going to be sacrificed who's also God's son very close to this area. Well, this is going to be the center of the worship complex for the tent. And the exchange is so important in the ancient Near East because remember, he says, oh, what is it? I'll give it to you. David says, no, I'm paying you full price. In the ancient Middle East, to have this type of biblical record antiquity is like a title today, a deed that you own your home outright. And it could not be contested. So this purchase, if you will, purchases the piece of property where eventually Solomon will then build the temple complex. In First Chronicles 21, 18 and following, all the more important. It's a, it's a fun story because um, Ornan gets a glimpse of the angel of the Lord and it kind of freaks him out. I'll give it to you. It's yours. You can have it. And it's, it's a funny story in a way, but David's going to play full price. Third, the book, to me, it reminds of God's promises. Uh, Over and over and over, God made these promises. If you do this, then I will do that. And we saw the pattern of David inquired of the Lord, David inquired of the Lord, David inquired of the Lord, David inquired of the Lord. And every time he did that, things worked out. Either yes, you go up to battle, or no, you don't go up to battle. Or you go up to battle, but you go this way. And then we read that chilling phrase, David inquired of the woman. He's now turned his affections as king to a horizontal. He wasn't inquiring of God. What if he would have inquired of God about, I see this woman uh, from my rooftop? But he inquired of the woman. And that, of course, begins the downfall of the Davidic reign. Four significant features that I try to put my arms around the book for you. And the first is the reference to the Davidic covenant. This is a dynasty. This is the most important empire on the planet, even in antiquity, and it will be again in the future. Uh, Many times remarkable throughout Israel's failure, their sin, their losses, their being exiled out of the country, their repatriation, if you will. Um, If you're a a fiction lover, uh, there's a rabbi who's deceased, uh, Chaim Potok, has written a bunch of novels about Judaism. And if you read some of his books and how they talk about the history of the Davidic covenant and how important it was throughout all of uh, everything that the Jew believed it's, it's a, a remarkable story of this piece of land that hangs on by its fingernails. Even within their own government, Orthodox who don't believe Israel's a state because it was declared one in 1947. Uh, even though the rabbis can't agree on who the Messiah is, even though the, the rabbinic groups hate each other in Israel, uh, it, the, the, the sex of religion within Judaism is like, Worse than Democrat versus Republican. I mean, it just, it never stops in Israel. And yet God allows that little sliver of land to hang on by its fingernails. The Davidic covenant is the benchmark. Second Samuel 7, verse 12, we looked at this. When your days are complete, 
You will lie down with your fathers. A euphemism, you're going to die. I will raise up your descendant after you. You're going to lie down, I'm going to raise up. Who will come forth from you and establish, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Not for a while, forever. This Davidic covenant was perpetual. It was forever. God establishes it. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And now we have the messianic nuance. He's talking about Solomon in the first application of this. But now he's talking about Jesus. He's going to come on the Davidic throne. That's the true Messiah. Every part of Israel's future in the writing is going to hinge then on Jesus' birth, about the eventual messianic throne. And now we're in that in-between time. And regardless of your view of end times, uh, which is a fun subject to study. Some people love it. Some people care less. The old jokes about, you know, pre-mill, post-mill, ah-mill, you know, I'm a pan-millennialist. It's not all going to pan out in the end and all the dumb jokes. Uh, Regardless of your view of end times, uh, one thing Scripture teaches, Jesus Christ will literally reign on this throne. Pretty hard to get around that. He will literally reign on a throne. And I believe that physical representation will begin in Israel and His second coming. Others may have different opinions. That's fine. Uh, So Number one, the Davidic covenant is central to God establishing His kingdom with His people His way. Second, a broad picture is Israel's centrality in biblical history. Again, this small country that's the size of Connecticut, it's not the size of the U.S. It's not the size of China or Europe or you know uh, Russia. What was it? Eleven time zones in Russia. If you've not traveled in Russia, you don't understand how massive that country is. This is the size of Connecticut. Little tiny, it's a state, not a country. The centrality of biblical history is there. And one of the insights people get when they go to Israel is what we call the Via Maris or the King's Highway or the International Highway. If you were to travel anywhere in the Middle East, you had to go, as it were, through Israel to get there. If you're, if you're dealing across European countries, you're coming into the east. If you come from Egypt, you've got to go through Israel. If you come through any of the Middle Eastern states, Jordan, Syria, over in the north, if you, uh, Damascus, if you, or Afghanistan, Iraq, where you've got, if you're going to travel, you have to come down that range, down the Mediterranean Sea, essentially through Israel. In other words, I, what would be the, what's like the one place... 65 and 440. If you're going to travel somewhere, you're going to have to hit the intersection at some point in your your travels, right? That's Israel. And that may be, I don't know, it seems to me a logical reason why God would choose that spot of land for for His nation, His people, called by His name to be planted on the the earth. And then, of course, Christ is born there. So Israel is born to fulfill God's promise of the Messiah who will come. And third, uh, standout warriors. This is an interesting part of First Chronicles, and uh, guys typically like this stuff. Uh, some people with you know maybe higher sensibilities, we we don't talk about war and fighting and battle and great warriors and great accomplishments. Um, I think to our to our uh, loss. Um, I'm not trying to glorify war, but uh, I do respect warriors. Uh, Cindy and I, living in Virginia for uh, the years we did, grew in an appreciation for the military. We had no understanding of the military until we lived in the D.C. area. And our appreciation went off the charts. Men and women who will serve uh, the country for, in most cases, very little pay. And uh, they, they, they swear an oath or they affirm an oath that they will put the country and the Constitution before their own lives. And when you see a person that loves Christ and happens, oh, by the way, to be in the military, uh, they, uh, that's the highest esteem I can give a person, that they're willing to do that. And Israel has a great record of some really, I can't use the word I want to use, uh, bad uh, men. <laughs> I mean, some really incredible men. And uh, they become known as David's 30 or the three or David's mighty men. And these guys were unbelievable. And Scripture not only acknowledges them, but explains them. Think of 
gladiatorial strength and power. Think of, you know, uh, maybe a movie you like, uh, Russell Crowe, whatever. Think about these guys in antiquity that had swords and shields and leather and maybe a little bit of armor if they could afford it. And these guys were incredible warriors. They were a man's man. They were heroic men. First Chronicles 11, verse 4. Then David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, that is Jebus, and the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, were there. The inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not enter here. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David had said, whoever strikes down a Jebusite first shall be chief and commander. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went up first, so he became chief. Then David dwelt in the stronghold, therefore it was called the city of David. Any of you who have gone to Israel, what's the word stronghold in Hebrew? Masada. Masada. The stronghold today when you go to Israel and you visit Masada may not be the stronghold. We can't prove it definitively, but I'd stake everything I understand about the land. That's one of David's strongholds. This text goes on to explain a little bit more. He built, David, he built around uh, the city all around from the Milo even to the surrounding areas. Joab repaired the rest of the city. David became greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. Now these are the heads of the mighty men whom David had who gave him strong support in his kingdom. Did you notice that? Everybody needs uh, strong leaders around them. David couldn't pull it off without the right military with all Israel to make him king according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. This wasn't his own making. I'm going to make an army. God said, you're going to put this together. These constitute the list of mighty men whom David had. And I'm going to read through some of these. I may bounce around a little bit just because it's it's a long section. But Jeshobiam, the son of Hakmonite, the chief of the thirty. He lifted up a spear against 300 whom he killed at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, and was one of, the mighty, one of the three mighty men. He was with David at Pasadim when the Philistines were gathered together there to battle. And there was a plot of ground full of barley, and the people fled before the Philistines. They took their stand in the midst of the plot and defended it, struck down the Philistines, and the Lord saved them by a great victory. Now three of the thirty chief men came down to the rock to David in the cave of Adullam while the, Philist- while the army of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, Masada, while the garrison of the Philistines was then at Bethlehem. And again, if you've been there, that's about eight miles apart where Masada is and where Bethlehem was is today. David had a craving, oh, that some would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem which is by the gate. That's about an eight-mile hike if I have the geography right. If they're at Masada and they're going to Bethlehem, about an eight-mile hike. So the three broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Far be it from me before my God, that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who were at risk of their own lives? For at the risk of the, of the lives they brought it, therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. As for Abishai, I love Abishai. I love Abishai. I, I, I have an axiom, every leader needs an Abishai, and every Abishai needs a leader. He was the brother of Joab. He was the chief of the 30. He swung a spear against 300 and killed them. He was named as of the 30 as well. Of the three in the second rank, he was the most honored and became their commander. However, he had not, did not attain to the three. And there's a big debate on who these three are. Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, mighty indeed, struck down two of the sons of Ariel and Moab. He also went down and killed a lion inside a pit on a snowy day. I heard a sermon one time on that one verse, and that was spellbinding. To be brave enough to go down and deal with an angry, hungry animal in a confined area that was going to be a problem 
at some point. And this guy says, somebody's got to do it. And he goes down with a sword, evidently, and takes care of a lion that would have been a great danger to them. He killed an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits tall. A cubit's about 18 inches. You can do the math. Now, in the Egyptian hand was a spear like a weaver's beam, but he went down to him with a club and snatched his spear. It's almost comical. Snatched his spear from the Egyptian hand and killed him with his own spear. These things Beniah, the son of Jehoiada, did. And had a name as well as the three mighty men. Behold, he was honored among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. David appointed him over his guard. Why do I read all this? Um, Conflict is real. Uh, Wars exist. It's bloody. It's messy. It's unfortunate. No one wants war. No one ever wants to glorify war. But when, uh, when God ordains a battle, it's these people are wicked, and they're going to affect or kill Israel to the point that God says, you got to stop this. you got to stop this. He knows whether they're going to repent or not. He didn't destroy Nineveh the first opportunity he had. He gave them time to change their mind, to repent. But other times God determines that this is going to be an ongoing irritation. They hate the God of Israel, and they hate the Israelites, and you may have to go to battle. And if you do, you want to do it with men like this, uh, not just some thrown-together army at the end. Fourth, and much more, but let me close with this fourth point, understanding what it means to bless God. We have so many religious words, and if you've heard me teach before, I have this sort of penchant for, I hate the Christian ease because it doesn't mean anything. When we say, you know, God bless you, what does that mean? Or we say, give glory to God, what does that mean? These, these, they're just Bible words, they're just religious words. And this chapter, uh, uh, First Chronicles 29, is for Michael, not theologically. It is the, 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 the definitive explanation of what it means to bless God and to understand what a blessing is. And I love this chapter, so I do want to read a good portion of it as my final uh, point this morning. First Chronicles 29, verse 10. So David blessed the Lord in the night of all, in the sight of all the assembly, and David said, Blessed are you, O Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Now, to give you a backstory, all the um, equipment and materials have been assembled and purchased for Solomon to be able to build the temple complex. David was not going to be the builder of the temple. That was going to be left to Solomon. So when they've accumulated all this, the chronicler re- records all that, and then once they realize we've got everything we need to build this temple complex, um, in other words, the project's paid for, it's out of debt before we even chisel the first piece of limestone. This is what David prays and how he responds. Verse 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth, yours is the dominion, O Lord. And you exalt yourself as head over all. If you're a Bible student, the second person pronoun, you and your, I've circled every one of my Bible. You, yours, you, yours, you, yours, because I miss it otherwise. It just becomes white noise as I'm reading it. You exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. Here's the king of Israel saying this. You rule over all. In your hands is power and might, and it lies in your hands to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you, and we praise your glorious name. And I love this. But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to offer as generously as this? When they saw the stockpile of wealth and materials in this little tiny country, this backwood shepherd boy, he goes, how in the world did this happen? That Your people did this. For all things come from you. Just pause for a second. Do you realize that in your own story? Any good thing that's happened to you is from him. Yeah, you might have had to work. You might have had to go get a degree. You might have had to promote yourself. But he gave you the ability to do it. Or it wouldn't have happened. All things come from you. And from your hand we've given to you. For we are but sojourners before you. We're tenants. This life at best is a clean bus station. As our fathers were, all the days of uh, our days on earth are like a shadow, and there's no hope. O oh Lord, our God, 
all this abundance that we have provided to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and it's all yours. Since I know, oh my God, that you try the heart and delight in uprightness, in the integrity of my heart, have willingly offered all these things. Again, I can't impress upon you. Go back to this again and again and again this week. This is one of the most richest prayers to understand acknowledging what blessing David is, is. This is what you've done, and now how I respond. Out of the integrity of my heart, you've willingly offered these things. So now with joy, I have seen your people who are present here. Make their offering willingly to you. O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your fathers, preserve this forever in the intentions of the heart of your people and direct their heart to you. And give my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, and do them, and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, now the congregation, now bless the Lord your God, and all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers. And they bowed low and did homage to the Lord and King. On the next day they made sacrifices to the Lord, offered burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs, with drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. So they ate and they drank, and that day before the Lord with great gladness, and they made Solomon the son of David king a second time, and they anointed him as ruler for the Lord and Zadok the priest. The bottom line is blessing is acknowledging everything is from him. Everything is about him. Every praise is due him, and apart from him, we're nothing. Read it with me. Blessing God is acknowledging everything is from him. Everything is about him. Every praise is due him, and apart from him, we are nothing. That's blessing. That's what you mean when you say, God bless you. Everything is due him, and I'm worth nothing, but you love me. That's what it means to bless God. Michael Easley in Context is fully funded from donations by our listeners. If you're a regular listener, would you consider giving a one-time or perhaps monthly donation on our website? You can find us on michaelincontext.com. In Context is engineered by Chad Cates, produced by Hannah Seymour, and music composed by Tycho, Chad Cates, and Blair Masters.